morning, brothers and sisters in Christ. Welcome once again to our online worship service. This morning, I would like us to listen and meditate on our devotional. Our devotional this morning is taken from Psalms 103 verse 2. It says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not all His benefits. It is entitled, Remembering God's Works. David begins this psalm by blessing the Lord for His holy name and character. He then urges his soul to hold on to what God has done to remember His benefits. Recalling the works of God is a critical part of the Christian life. Throughout the Bible, men and women created ways to remember the acts of God. Whether through stone memorials, writing things down, or telling stories for the coming generations, the people of God placed great importance in reminiscing on all that God had done. In today's culture, I am afraid pondering the many blessings of God is not high on the list of priorities for many of us but it should be at the top of that list. How can you remember what God has done for you? Believe me, I realize that it's much easier to forget than to remember. Memory can be a flicking thing. So let me ask you a question. Have you thought about journaling? Journaling gives us the opportunity to remind ourselves of significant events in our lives or the things would like to reflect upon down the road. What if you began to journal for the sake of recording the different ways of the Lord is working in your life and things He is teaching you in His Word? So you might ask, what's the point of doing this? Just as the people of God did in the Bible. He write these things down so that at the later date, we can not only remind ourselves of just how faithful God has been to us, but we can pass our journal on to bless others in the future. Psalm 103 verse 2 is like a journaling session for David as he recalls in the midst of his pleasure and pain. The countless ways the Lord had blessed and been faithful to Him. Let's challenge ourselves to write down the evidence of the kindness of our God so that in time of trouble, our soul will want to bless the Lord. Amen. This is a very good reminder to all of us, brothers and sisters, that uh, we tend to easily forget what God has done for us and who God is. Every time we face difficult situations in our lives, we tend to forget who our God is and what He has done for us in the past. That's why we have this tendency to be overcome by discouragement. But brothers and sisters, let us be reminded of who our God is and what He has done for us in the past and what He can do to our circumstances today. So brothers and sisters, this morning, I would like to encourage each and every one of us, let us remind ourselves of who our God is, our Heavenly Father, our loving God, and what He has done for us. Let us pray. Our Father in heaven, great is your name in all the earth. We acknowledge your goodness and faithfulness to us in the past. In this time of pandemic, O Lord, you have protected and provided for us. In, this, in times of sickness, you healed us. In times of trouble, you rescued us. In times of struggle, you have sustained us. In times of weakness, you have strengthened us. In times of sorrow, you have comforted us. In times of need, you have provided for us. In times of suffering, you gave us rest. 
You have done so much for us, O God, in the past. But sometimes we tend to forget, O Lord, what are those things that you have done for us. So today, Lord, we ask for your forgiveness that we forget, O God, who you are and what you have done to us. And we have succumbed to discouragement in our lives. So today, Lord, we ask that your Holy Spirit will lift us up again, would remind us of the great things that you have done, would remind us of how great your love towards us, O God. And we ask, O God, that you would fill our hearts with encouragement today, knowing that all things are uh, being taken care of by you, O God. You are in control of everything and that you are a God who work all things together for good in our lives. So we ask, O God, today that you would uh, remind us, O God, what you have done for us, O God, in the past. And we thank you, Lord, and we praise you because you, as we recall all those things, Lord, that you have done for us, we have found you to be faithful and true to your promises towards us, O God. And that is our hope that what you have promised and what you have said in your word, we can claim it, O God, and we can experience it because of Jesus Christ in our lives. So today, Lord, we ask that you would change our hearts, O God. If, we, if our hearts are filled with discouragement, encourage us today, O God, with your presence. Lord, we commit this day to you, this worship service, this time of worship. May you be honored and glorified, O God. May our hearts filled with joy and encouragement this morning. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Good morning, DBC, and welcome to our English service online this beautiful Sunday. As we begin our worship, let us take our reading from the verses of Deuteronomy 6. Now start. Hear, O Israel, the Lord our God, the Lord is one. These commandments that I give you today are to be on your hearts. And together, so that it may go well with you and you may go in and take over the land the Lord promised on oath to your ancestors. Let us now bring our hearts to God, church, and tell Him that we will love and serve Him with our entire being. Amen. Amen. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. With all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, with all your strength. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind, and with all your strength. Serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. Whoa, I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength. With all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, with all my strength. I will serve the Lord with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind. With all my strength. Isn't it wonderful, church? To love the Lord with all your being and declare that He is the one in our hearts. Come on, let's continue our worship and declare that we love Him because He deserves everything. Amen.
all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all my strength, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, oh, with all my strength. I will love you, Lord, with all my heart, with all my soul, with all my mind, and with all Sing this together. Oh Lord my God, when I in awesome wonder consider all the worlds thy hands have made, I see the stars, I hear the rolling thunder, thy power throughout.
Let us declare that our God is great. Hallelujah, church. Hallelujah. Amen. Amen. Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Indeed, we declare that God is great. God is amazing. And you know what? His love, it extended not just to the chosen, but even to those that are considered enemies of God. While we were still sinners, Christ died for the ungodly. Christ died for you. Christ died for me. And so, yes, church, let us sing this song and declare that God's love is an amazing love. Amen. I'm forgiven because you were forsaken. I'm accepted, you were condemned. I'm alive and well, your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king should die for me amazing love I know it's true it's my joy
Good day, my dear friends and brethren in the Lord. As we are about to end this love month of February, let me culminate it with a story that inspired through the years billions of people around the world who have read, heard, and applied the message of the story. I pray you will be blessed too as you hear, receive, and apply His Word into your life. God bless you. Shall we pray? God, our Father, we come in the name of your Son, our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. We thank you for the gift of life, and we thank you for this opportunity that once again we can worship you in spirit and in truth by listening to your word. We ask that your word will be received by your people with gladness in their hearts, and your word will fall on good grounds of their hearts, that it will take root and will grow and bear fruit for the glory of your name. Father, may you accomplish what you intend to accomplish today in the lives of your people. I pray for those who have special needs today that you will minister to them in a very special way too. I pray, Lord, for the Makaspak family, that you will comfort them in this time of grief and sorrow. We ask that you will protect and uh, give your love and uh, assurance that you are with them, O oh God, even for Brother Arnell in the U.S. and uh, Sister Alma in Manila, Brother Arvin and uh, family here in Dabao, and Sister Elaine, uh, the widow of Brother Alan. Father, may you comfort all of them in this time of grief. May you, O oh God, have your peace reign in their hearts, knowing that our blessed hope is in the Lord Jesus Christ. Thank you again for this day that we can listen and receive your word into our lives. As your blessing now, in Jesus' name, amen and amen. The story I mentioned earlier that inspired billions of people is taken from the Gospel of Luke, chapter 10, 25 to 37. It says, On one occasion, an expert in the law stood up to test Jesus. Teacher, he asked, What must I do to inherit eternal life? What is written in the law? He replied, How do you read it? He answered, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and love your neighbor as yourself. You have answered correctly, Jesus replied. Do this and you will live. But he wanted to justify himself, so he asked Jesus, And who is my neighbor? In reply, Jesus said, a man was going down from Jerusalem to Jericho when he was attacked by robbers. They stripped him of his clothes and beat him and went away, leaving him half dead. A priest happened to be going down the same road, 
And when he saw the man, he passed by on the other side. So too a Levite, when he came to the place and saw him, passed by the other side. But a Samaritan, as he traveled, came where the man was. And when he saw him, he took pity on him. He went to him and bandaged his wounds, pouring on oil and wine. Then he put the man on his own donkey, brought him to an inn, and took care of him. The next day, he took out two denarii and gave them to the innkeeper. Look after him, he said, and when I return, I will reimburse you for any extra expense you may have. Which of these three do you think was a neighbor to the man who fell into the hands of robbers? The expert in the law replied, The one who had mercy on him. Jesus told him, Go and do likewise. The title I have given to this message is Loving Your Neighbor, taken from the parable of the Good Samaritan. It is said that loving God is easy, but it is loving people that is difficult. Do you agree? It should be made clear that the quote does not say that we cannot or it is impossible to love people, but it says it is difficult to love people. In fairness, not all people are hard to love. There are people who are easy to love, like the people you hardly know and are not familiar with you. This is so because the more familiar you are with people, the harder they become to get along with. That is why we have a saying, familiarity breeds contempt. In all honesty, based on my experience, it is really hard and difficult. In fact, if not for the grace of God, it would be next to impossible to love people, especially people who have offended you deeply. But the Bible is clear. In 1 John chapter 4, 20-21, it says, Whoever claims to love God, yet hates a brother or sister, is a liar. For whoever does not love their brother and sister whom they have seen, cannot love God whom they have not seen. And He has given us this command, Anyone who loves God must also love their brother and sister. The teaching to love people as we love God is not a suggestion, nor is it an option, but it is a command. Today, we are going to look into a familiar but often misunderstood story in the New Testament. Told by Jesus in the form of a parable, the parable of the Good Samaritan. Yes, this parable has inspired billions of people, but it has caused some debates and confusion from scholars. I said this parable is often misunderstood because some commentators, theologians, and preachers would often use this parable as a foundation for social action as the story is viewed to define and describe who our neighbor is and how we are to love our neighbor, which is the second greatest commandment. But others say this is not about social action, but this parable is about evangelism. Jesus told this parable primarily not to lay a principle describing who is our neighbor and how to love them. No, but he told this story to address the question of the lawyer about what he needs to do to inherit eternal life in verse 25. In other words, this parable is not about social action that teaches how to love our neighbor, but this is about evangelism, how to inherit eternal life. 
this parable teaches people how to be saved. Today, let us try with the help of the Spirit of Understanding who guides us into all truth to untie and unravel the misunderstanding on this parable. In understanding a parable, generally, we do three things. First, know what is the setting, why the parable was given or told. Second, understand what the story in the parable is all about. And third, discover the significance of the story that is usually uncovered or understood in a form of a shocker, a surprise, a sudden twist in the story. That's where you find the significance. Let's start with the setting. The setting of the story is laid in verse 25 to 29. In these verses, we read why this parable was told. Verse 25 says, And a lawyer stood up and put him to the test, saying, Teacher, what shall I do to inherit eternal life? Highlight those words. What shall I do to inherit eternal life? And in verse 26, Jesus said to him, What is written in the law? How does it read to you? And he answered, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your strength, and with all your mind, and your neighbor as yourself. And Jesus said to him, You have answered correctly. Do this and you will live. But wishing to justify himself, the lawyer said to Jesus, And who is my neighbor? I have highlighted the two questions because they provide the key for us to unravel and untie the misunderstanding people have on this parable. These two questions provide the key indicators for understanding this parable. That this parable is set in an evangelistic thrust as shown by the first question, what must I do to inherit eternal life? But it also lays down what it means to love our neighbor as a foundation for all social action expressed in the second question. Who is my neighbor? In other words, we do not need to pit one against the other by emphasizing and preferring one interpretation over the other as the only intention why this parable was given. No, rather, both are to be considered and embraced as vital or significant points to what Jesus wants to teach us. Let us now go to the proper story. Jesus began to tell a parable in response primarily to the last question asked by the lawyer. Who then is my neighbor? But through a process of introspection and personal reflection, the hearer is indirectly evangelized or made aware of his or her need of a Savior and thus addressing the first question, what can I do to inherit eternal life? Let us now review and examine the story. First, let us look at the scene of this story. The road from Jerusalem to Jericho was a notoriously dangerous road. Jerusalem is on top of a hill, while Jericho was downhill below as shown in the photo. The elevation is 2,700 and then the Jericho, the elevation is 850 degrees below sea level. The elevation was like the Shrine Hills here in Davao City going down MacArthur Highway in Matina, if you are familiar with the place. Shrine Hills would represent Jerusalem and 
and Matina MacArthur Highway would represent Jericho. But unlike Shrine Hills down to Matina Road, the terrain from Jerusalem to Jericho was narrow and rocky and had sudden turns which made it a strategic place for robbers and bandits to stage their evil activities. Look at the photo. It's like this. The terrain was rugged and there were many places for robbers and bandits to hide. Now, the second thing we need to look at from in the story is let us look at the characters. First, there was the traveler. He was obviously an unsuspecting traveler, a reckless character, unmindful of the dangers and risks that may happen ahead. Or he would simply be like a Filipino, a risk taker who believes in suerte. Kahit may mga babala na, na may bagyo, pumapalaot at bumabiyahe pa rin kasi baka sakali makaswerte mawala ang bagyo. Ganun ba? Ganun din sa pandemya ngayon na nararanasan natin. Kahit may mga babala na, ayaw pa rin sumunod ang mga tao. Going back to our parable, people seldom attempted the Jerusalem to Jericho Road alone if they were carrying goods and valuables. Seeking safety in numbers, they traveled in convoys or caravans. This man had no one but himself to blame for his plight in which he found himself. He traveled by himself. The next characters to be introduced by Jesus in the story are the robbers and bandits. There were robbers and bandits. Again, the road was a known path for robbers to stage their evil activities. And this being so, the unsuspecting traveler, Jesus said, fell among robbers in verse 30. Just out of nowhere, the robbers came and hit him, took everything he had, including the clothes on his back. He was left probably with undergarments and that is it. But what was very sad and unfortunate was that they didn't just rob him. They stripped him and beat him and kept on beating him until he was virtually on the brink of death. In critical condition, lying on the ground, blooded and half dead. To those who were hearing the story the first time, they were in suspense. They may be saying to themselves, Oh no, who will help this poor victim? Then came the priests. There was the priest. Jesus did not for long hold them in suspense. He immediately introduced a new character, a priest. And perhaps some of the listeners were clapping their hands when they heard the new character was introduced. Jesus said, And by chance, a priest was going down on the throne. And the crowd may have said, Yay! Yes! Here comes the hero! The crowd of listeners may have softly exclaimed, Here comes the hero! Here comes the rescuer, the priest. For people know and the lawyer knows that priests know and are familiar with God's command spoken through the prophet Micah, chapter 6, 6 to 8. And it says there, With what shall I come before the Lord and bow down before the exalted God? Shall I come before him with burnt offerings, with calves a year old? Will the Lord be pleased with thousands of rams, with ten thousand river of olive oil? Shall I offer my firstborn for my transgression, the fruit of my body for the sin of my soul? He has shown you, O mortal, what is good, and what does the Lord require of you to act justly and to love mercy 
and to walk humbly with your God. The priest and all religious leaders know this command by heart that God prefers for people to act justly, to love mercy, to walk humbly with God rather than giving Him ceremonial offerings. But in a tragic twist and to the hearer's disappointment, as Jesus continued on with the story, he said, When the priest saw the victim, he passed by on the other side. Verse 31. Again, in deep disappointment, the crowd was wondering, What will happen to the poor victim? Who will rescue him? Will he survive? The mood was tense and suspenseful. Again, without further ado, Jesus introduced a new religious character. There was the Levite. A Levite is also a religious man who works in the temple to assist the priest in the care of the temple. Maybe he will be the hero and the rescuer as the crowd would hope for. But like the priest, he ignored and avoided the victim. Verse 32 says, Likewise, a Levite also, when he came to the place and saw him, the victim, pass by on the other side. Jesus did not elaborate the reasons why they choose to ignore and avoid the victim. <clears throat> Some say the priest and the Levite thought and feel the victim was already dead and to go near or touch a dead person may cause them to become ceremonially unclean or defiled. That may result to their disqualification in fulfilling their religious duties for a week. In Numbers 19.11 says, Whoever touches a human corpse will be unclean for seven days. In other words, they will be subjected to a seven-day quarantine. If this happens, they can't show for work and do church ministry. However, despite their knowledge of what God wants and expects from them, based on Micah chapter 6, 6 to 8, when as we have read, that God prefers them to act justly and to love mercy and to walk humbly with God, more than ceremonial worship and offerings. Their avoidance seems to imply, however, that the priest and Levite preferred to adhere to religious ceremonial rules and regulations, as well as follow the religious commitments more than the important requirement of God to love people, to show mercy and save lives. They preferred to set the claims of the ceremonial above those of charity. The temple and its liturgy meant more to them than the pain of the man. The crowd at this instance may have felt in utter self-righteous contempt for these two religious personalities who they hoped and expected to be their heroes in the story. But I would like to caution ourselves from having such a self-righteous attitude and express contempt and condemnation towards the priest and Levite who both went on the other side of the road. I hate to tell you this, but in condemning them, you condemn yourself and I condemn myself. Because if you are going to have to be honest enough, you and I would see ourselves in those two people, the priest and the Levite, because that's how we behave most of the time. Yes, most of the time. We go the other way. We make excuses and choose the convenient way, the way where there is not much complication, the way of none involvement, the way of apathy and indifference. 
than in the mood of anger and disappointment mixed with a hopeful anticipation of a hero. The crowd waited for Jesus to introduce the hero, the Savior. Then there was the Samaritan. When Jesus introduced the Samaritan, the Jewish listeners, including the lawyer, may have frowned and growled even with greater contempt than their contempt on the priest and Levite. The listeners would obviously expect the arrival of the Samaritan, the villain had arrived. For the Jews despised the Samaritans and had no dealings with them. They had a long-standing enmity with each other and their animosity and hostility was already deep-seated. A Samaritan is a mestizo Jew who had compromised his racial purity and religious integrity by intermarriage with non-Jews, that is, Gentiles, as well as these Samaritans embrace a deficient religious beliefs and practices different from the Jews. Their place of worship was not in Jerusalem, but in Mount Gerizim of Samaria. They only believe in the five books of Moses and nothing more. They don't hold to the whole of Old Testament scriptures. The Jews hated and despised and looked down on the Samaritans because for the Jews, Samaritans are half-breed traitors. You see, during the time of Nehemiah's rebuilding of the wall, they, the Samaritans, opposed the project and sided with the enemy to disrupt the work. In fact, if you wanted to say something bad about someone, you call him a Samaritan. So to be called a Samaritan has become a derogatory name calling for a Jew, like calling a black man nigger or defining a Filipino as a domestic helper. When Jesus had a hostile confrontation with the Jewish religious leaders, they despised Jesus so much that they name called Jesus a Samaritan and a demon possessed. You can see this in John chapter 8, verse 32. With this social and historical background, Jesus brought him in, the Samaritan, into the story, into the scene. To their shock, to the listener's shock, this Samaritan showed kindness to the victim. Jesus was like saying in contemporary terms, a Baptist pastor came, but when he saw the victim, he passed the other way. A worship leader came by, also saw the victim, but like the pastor, he too went the other way. But then, an atheist businessman passed by, saw the victim, he stopped, he stooped and he soothed the man's wounds with antiseptics, pouring oil and wine, strapped his wounds with bandages, and saved the man. Isn't that, that shocking? That these so-called religious leaders, the Baptists, the worship leader, did ignore the victim, pass him by? But here comes... An atheist who does not believe in God, who does not fear God, and yet when he saw the victim, he had pity on the victim, helped the victim, and saved the victim. That's shocking, right? This too was shocking when, they, when the Jews and the lawyer heard the story of the Samaritan showing kindness to the victim. They were shocked. We know three things about the Samaritan. First, he alone was prepared to help. The man not only took him to the inn, 
But he stayed with him. He took him in the inn, put him down to rest, stayed at his side all night doing whatever he needs to do. Provided food for the man, provided comfort for the man, water, cleansing his wounds all night. You say, well, how do you know he stayed all night? Because the next verse in verse 35, Jesus says, On the next day. This is really amazing care for an enemy. An all-night vigil. An atheist or heretic he may have been. But the love of God was in his heart. It is not a new experience to find the traditional religion more interested in dogmas than in help and to find the man that traditional religion despises to be the one who loves his fellow men. In the end, we will be judged not by the creed we hold, but by the love we give. Second thing we must we can observe from this Samaritan is that his credit was good. Clearly, the innkeeper was prepared to trust him. He may have been theologically unsound, but he was an honest man. Then, the next day, he takes out two denarii. Now, a denarius is equivalent to that of a day's wage. If our minimum wage is 500, then two denarii would be 1,000. Now, during that time, the worth of a regular inn or a lodging house was 1 over 32 of a denarius. 1 over 32 of a denarius would mean that the man for two denarii could, you do the math, he could stay for two months. Imagine that, two months. This victim can regain health and, and strength by staying there for two months because it was already paid for by the Samaritan. What is the point? The point is, we can see it in the third characteristic of this Samaritan. He was graciously generous. This is the point. The point is, this is lavish generosity. This is gracious generosity. This is the ultimate attention that could possibly be given. You go over there, you check him out, you tear your clothes, your own clothes, you bind up his wounds, you pour oil and wine as an antiseptic and soothe him and perhaps rubbing his wounds and bruises. You put him on your animal, you take him to the inn, you provide for him to stay for two months in the inn, you stay overnight with him and as if that's not enough, what do you do? You say to the innkeeper, take care of him. And whatever more you spend, when I return, I will repay you. Now, what the Samaritan said to the innkeeper was a temptation for extortion or for him to be taken advantage of. What? You're telling an innkeeper, whatever you want to spend on the guy, spend on the guy and I'll pay you when I come back. This can only mean lavish love this is gracious generosity can you see this this is love without limit love without boundaries that's the whole point he the samaritan exposes himself of course to being extorted but such is the nature of his love this is what he would do for himself if he was in the position of the victim. That's the whole point of this story. This is lavish love. 
amazing generosity for a complete stranger to one who is considered an enemy and vice versa, his enemy, the victim who is a Jew, is hated by him, a Samaritan. But that's what our Lord is saying here. This is loving your neighbor as you love yourself. That's what you would do for you, wouldn't you? Getting lavish love? Of course you would. Have you ever done that for somebody else or for anybody else? Do you do that for everybody else in that condition? Let us look now at the point or teaching of the parable, the significance. As we noted earlier, that the significance of the story is often revealed through sudden shockers in the story. And the shocker in the story was that a Samaritan despised by Jews was the hero of the day. He acted in love for the victim. Whoa! An atheist! An unbeliever! What a shocker! We could not believe our ears. A man with no God, no religion with, would be the one to show love and kindness. Could it be real? Well, that is how it sounded to the first listeners of Jesus. The Samaritan was the hero, the rescuer in the story. So this time, Jesus asked the lawyer, Which of these three do you think proved to be a neighbor to the man who fell into the robber's hands? The lawyer, who was a Jew, still could not believe and accept that a Samaritan would be the hero in fulfilling the second greatest commandment that he, the lawyer, could not even utter the name Samaritan, but evasively and shrewdly said, the man who had shown mercy to the victim. And Jesus said to him, Go and do likewise. Uh, Jesus' answer involves three things. First, don't be selective with neighbors to love. This was the mistake of the religious leaders. They classify, select, and identify who are to be their neighbors worthy of their love. Ganun ba kayo? You are very selective to who are to be your neighbors and receive your love for them? In Matthew 5, 43 to 45, it says here, Jesus said, You have heard that it was said, Love your neighbor and hate your enemy. But I tell you, love your enemies and pray for those who persecute you, that you may be children of your Father in heaven. This verse, these verses that Jesus said here, to love our neighbor includes our enemy as part of the neighbor we are to love. So, the point that Jesus is making here, we must not be selective as to who the neighbors we are to show love. Second, be a neighbor to anyone who is in need. You see, if you as you follow the story, Jesus made a twist regarding the commandment. Instead of finding a neighbor to love he said be a neighbor to people in need we must help a man even when he has brought his trouble on himself as the traveler had done we must act neighborly to any man of any nation who is in need our help must be as wide as the love of god third lesson that we can get from what Jesus is saying is the help must be practical and does not consist merely in feeling sorry. No doubt, 
the priest and the Levite felt a pang of pity for the wounded man. But they did nothing. Compassion to be real must issue in deeds. What Jesus said to the lawyer, He also says to us, Go and do the same. Four steps to act like the good Samaritan. First, see the needs of the people around you. 1 Corinthians 10, 24 says, Don't be concerned for your own good, but for the good of others. Second, sympathize with people's pain. If you want to be like the good Samaritan, first, you have to see the needs around you, then sympathize with people's pain. 2 Corinthians 1, 3, and 4. Praise be to the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of compassion and the God of all comfort, who comforts us in all our troubles so that we can comfort those in any trouble with the comfort we ourselves receive from God. You see, the, one of the reasons why God allows trouble pain and suffering to happen in our lives, not only for us to grow strong in faith, but for us to become ministers to others who are in pain, for us to be channels of God's comfort because we have received comfort from Him during the time when we were in trouble. And so because of that, we can be God's instruments to channel the comfort we have received from God during our time of trouble to those who are presently in trouble. Learn to sympathize with the pains of people. Third, for us to be like the good Samaritan, not only are we to see the needs of people, not only are we to sympathize with the pains of people, we must seize the moment and meet the needs of people. Proverbs 3, 27 to 28, it says here, Do not withhold good from those who deserve it when it is in your power to help them. If you can help your neighbor now, don't say come back tomorrow, then I'll help you. No, but God is saying do it now. Seize the moment to help just like what the Samaritan did. And then fourth, share. Share whatever it takes. Galatians 6, 10 says, Therefore, whenever we have the opportunity, we should do good to everyone, especially those in the family of faith. The Samaritan was not reluctant or hesitant in sharing his resources to help the victim. He spent... He was willing to spend and to spend more for the recovery of the victim. That was lavish generosity, gracious love. And that is how it is to love your neighbor. Can you do that? Now let's go to the evangelistic aspect of the parable. As an evangelistic trust, the question was asked by the lawyer, what must I do to inherit eternal life? This triggered everything. This question of the lawyer was like the question of the rich young ruler in Luke 18, 18 to 23. Jesus at the outside pointed him to the law and told him to do and obey the commandments and he will live. That is, he will inherit eternal life or salvation if he can obey the commandments. But the lawyer evaded the directive of Jesus to apply what, what he knew about the commandments of God. Instead, tried to excuse himself by asking another question, Who is my neighbor? Hoping he can avoid what the law requires of him regarding the issues of eternal matters like salvation. But Jesus brought him back to the point of reflection and realization 
that religion and observance of the law cannot give eternal life. This is represented by the priest and the Levite. They failed. They failed to obey the commands. How much more the ordinary people. Instead, the lawyer needs to realize that since religion and observance of the law cannot give eternal life, he needs a Savior to be saved. You see, religion and observance of the law cannot give eternal life. Why can't religion and observance of the law give salvation? In the story, Jesus wants to let the lawyer who is part of the Jewish religious group to see and be humbled to acknowledge that religion, even religious persuasions as represented by the priest and the Levite, the assistant of the priest in the story, fall short in truly obeying and practicing the commandment to love one's neighbor as thyself. That it is really hard or even impossible for people to fulfill the law and find salvation in it. While the law is good and can bring salvation if obeyed, followed and applied consistently and perfectly in life. However, the truth of the matter is, we can't. It is impossible to fulfill the commandments consistently and completely. Do you agree? We are not always good all the time. We can be good for a moment. We can love for a moment, but the following moments, we act like devils. The good Samaritan loves the man as he loved himself. Do we do that all the time? You probably cannot even think of a time in your life when you did that. That's reserved for you and maybe for your wife and kids. But is this your constant life pattern? If you love Burger Kings to eat, do you serve and give Burger Kings also when you give to the poor and hungry? Because the command says you must love your neighbor as yourself. Now, I may have used the command too literally, but the point is the way you want to be treated, the way you want to be fed, if hungry, the way that you want to be health if you have a need should be the same, the same way you would treat and feed and help a person who desperately needs your help. Say you can do it. You, say, you, you may say you can do it, but can you give consistently all the time? Even to the people you don't like? Baka lasunin mo pa nga sila eh. Can you, like the good Samaritan, show love is love? The people who do social justice work and think they are fulfilling this need to look at it again. Because unless you do that all the time perfectly and love God all the time perfectly, you're not going to have eternal life if you're coming by the way of the law. What Jesus wants to drive out to the lawyer and to all mankind is that before we can truly love our neighbor as ourselves, we must first receive and experience love. Because we cannot give love to others if we are empty of it. And if we do express this love, we need to find its source to be sustained. For this to happen, we need a Savior who is the source of this love, the real good Samaritan himself, Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. We need a Savior. Since religion and observance to the law is impossible to give eternal life, we need and must desire a Savior, and that Savior is Jesus. Do you want to inherit eternal life? Do you want to be a loving neighbor to others in need? Invite Jesus into your life, and He will save 
and He will save you and give you eternal life. He will empower you with His love for you to be moved with compassion to the poor and the needy people and share His love with them. Why don't you pray this prayer with me today? Let us pray. Lord Jesus, I want to inherit eternal life. Your word tells me you are the word of life who gives eternal life to all those who believe and call your name. So today, I call on your name because I believe you can give me eternal life. Now, Lord, enable me also to tell others about you and empower me to be a loving neighbor to others in need. In your name I pray, amen and amen. I hope that you pray that prayer to receive Christ into your life, for He has given you eternal life. Not only has He given you eternal life, He will empower you to be the kind of neighbor God wants you to be to people around you. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up His countenance and grant you peace, now and forevermore. Amen. God bless you. Thank you, Pastor, for the very wonderful message. I know that deep in, our, in my heart, in the hearts of everyone who heard your message today, they will bring that with them so that the whole world will know that Jesus indeed is alive. And He is worthy to receive all glory, honor, and praise. Amen.
Yes, church, live a life that receives the love of God and giving back to Him the praise that is due Him. Go, therefore, and declare that Jesus Christ is Lord, not just today, but every day. God bless you, church. Have a good Sunday ahead. Thank mm-hmm. you.